Welcome. Welcome to Nature Calls, everyone. Thanks for joining us at the Nature Conservancy in Alabama. TNC Alabama is a group of 20 conservationists working together to conserve the land and water for nature and people. I'm Jeff Ware, the Director of Philanthropy for TNC Alabama. And Nature Calls is our virtual field trip where we share a new conservation project in Alabama each month on the second Thursday at 3 p.m. Before we start our program today, here are a few housekeeping items. Number one, I want to let you know that we are recording this Zoom program. And if you'd like a copy, send us an email at philanthropy.alabama at tnc.org. Number two, we're muting your microphone. If you wish to comment, please type your comment or question into the chat at the bottom of your screen. This makes it easier for our presenter to manage the questions and answers at the end of the program. And finally, the program is approximately 15 minutes long with another 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. Now I'm very pleased to introduce Judy Hayner, Director of Marine Programs, on a tour of the trials and tribulations of the Alabama coast. Hi everyone, I'm going to try to share my screen and um, this isn't about one project today. It's um, taking us a little bit around some areas um, on the not so glamorous side of being a TNC employee and but one thing that I kind of got hung up on was, I, you know, we call it TNC and the Nature Conservancy, but some folks don't know what that is. And I, and I thought, well, everybody goes to Google, you know, so if you don't know what something is, you type it in. And so I started searching around and what did I find were these questions of what people thought TNC was about. So I'm going to answer them now and uh, in a kind of a rapid fire situation. So are we a transportation network company? We are not. That's Lyft, that's Uber. We use them, but we're not part of them. That's not us. Is TNC a transnational corporation? Not officially, but we are international. We work in 73 countries and 50 states, so we're kind of transnational. Is TNC a federal agency? No, we are a nonprofit. <laughs> we are not a federal agency, but we are here to help. Is TNC legitimate? We are absolutely legitimate, and I cannot figure out who might be Googling this. It just doesn't make sense to me in any sense of the fashion. Who funds TNC? Well, I think you'll hear a lot um, from the different talks that go on about how we get state and federal funds. We write a lot of grants for those, but more than 50% of our budget actually comes from private funds. And we use those private funds to leverage those state and federal grants. So I thought that was a really good question. Where is TNC? Well, as I mentioned during the transnational corporation discussion, we're everywhere. We're international. So we're in all 50 states plus 70 some countries. And I think that's good, you know? So what are TNC's top priorities? Now, this was a really smart question. <laughs> Our top priorities um, right now are protecting land, fresh water and oceans. It's something we've done for a long time and I think we do it really, really well. Um, our second highest priority is trying to figure out how we adapt or mitigate climate change impacts. And really that ends up tying back into protecting land, fresh water and oceans. So I think it's really all one large mission and we're just looking at how we're evolving over time. Now with that, we're gonna jump into a couple of things. Um, it's not really gonna be a tour. What I'm gonna do is actually take us through um, some of what I call the hardest days we've had in the field. But as we do that, I'm gonna ask you all some questions. So don't worry about the website side of things, but if you can all get your phones and in the numbers where you would send a text message, where you would put the number, if you would type into that phone, 22333, on the phone number, and then in the message line, type in Judy Hayner 908 and enter. It'll basically open up this poll so that when I get to one of these questions, y'all will be able to type something in and hopefully 
I am not the techno queen, and I think any of you who know me know that, but hopefully it will work and we'll see some kind of cool answers from everybody on the screen. So everybody got that? So in the, in the phone number line, 22333, and then in text, Judy Hayner 908. Okay? So I thought rather than giving you the warm and fuzzy tour of what we do on the coast, I thought I would actually take you through some of the hardest things that we do, the non-glamorous side of working in the field at the Nature Conservancy. And the first place I wanted to take you was a trip that I got to go to in Hong Kong, which was frankly fantastic, except that Hong Kong is really darn hot. I thought Alabama was hot. We got nothing on Hong Kong. Um, for some reason, this is not letting me, here we go. So um, the day started with our boat. You can see high and dry, that makes it really interesting when you're trying to get out and see some sights. Um, no, really, this boat is a boat that the oyster aquaculture folks use to land their um, oysters from their aquaculture platforms just offshore, and we'll see those um, in the future slides. They come in in these baskets in the middle picture, You'll see the baskets that are there <clears throat> that the gentleman is kind of picking at the oysters. So they off the oystermen offload from the boat these um, baskets of oysters, and the gentleman, like this guy in the shorts, basically pulls those up to the edge of the market and then shucks them. You see the shucked oysters in the um, the orange bucket on the south end of that middle picture. It's um, the raw oysters just there in water. And uh, June from our China program is in the upper right-hand corner holding one of the oysters because these are really big oysters. These are six to seven inch oysters. They are not for the lighthearted. Um, and what they do is they take those oysters and they put them on drying racks like you see on that lower left corner. And they dry these things out. And the, and the interesting thing is they take all those dried oysters, they grind them up and they make them into oyster sauce. So when you go and buy your Kikkoman oyster sauce at the market, that's where these oysters are coming from. So all really good. The one disturbing thing, and there are trays and trays of dried oysters and dried fish at these markets, but there were no bugs, which is kind of interesting to think that you have literally almost miles of drying seafood and not a bug in sight. I was kind of grateful because as you can see, June is sweating, we all were sweating. This was probably 100 plus degrees, zero breeze. So I was grateful that there weren't bugs on top of that. But um, again, it was a very challenging day to say the least. So what do we have in common with Hong Kong and with China? Well, they're huge into aquaculture. And if you look from left to right on the map, you basically were zooming into Lao Faoshan um, Bay here in Hong Kong. And you can see the number of rafts as you progress across the screen. And those rafts are about 50 by 25 feet in, in, uh, in size. They have um, about every foot, they have a string hanging down, eight to 15 feet. It just depends, you know, if the string rotted or whatever. They pre-string these, they pre-seed these strings with oysters. And they hang these strings off of underneath the raft. And then those oysters grow up there and then they bring them in. It's a huge, huge industry. Apparently, globally, we eat a lot of oyster sauce. Um, more than 7,000 rafts just in this one bay, over 120 tons of meat annually, and over 10 million just from this bay <laughs> contributing to this, and there are multiples of these in other areas. The interesting thing is when I went in 2015, I had barely tapped into meeting Steve Crockett also on this call, um, and some of the aquaculture oystermen that we have here in Alabama. So it's been very interesting to see um, synergies and uh, sharing with them how we were up and coming and how what they had learned over time, which I thought was really great. And TNC is an incredible platform for sharing those lessons learned across different countries and across different cultures. So if you've got your phone handy, um, our first question is, where do you think TNC Alabama is partnering on conservation actions? Type A if you think China, B if you think Australia, C if you think Zambia, and D if you think all of the above. And I can't, I'm, okay, sliding my, I have to slide my pictures out of the way. Is everybody really already logged in and answering D because it's true? And who would have thought 
The Little Alabama program of 20 staff that Jeff, met, Jeff mentioned is working on collaborations in China and on collaborations in Australia, on fire in Zambia, but I mean, Alabama is really out there making a difference. And so I hope you all are as excited and proud of that work as we are, even though at times it's really challenging. So as we count down these top hardest field days, my number four um, field days are at Grand Bay and Lightning Point. And if you look at the map in the lower corner, that's um, in Mississippi Sound there. And this picture is beautiful. It is an incredible pine savanna, just fantastic on a great day. You can see for miles. You stand on certain points, you can see literally Pascagoula, Mississippi and the Dauphin Island Bridge. I mean, it is just a fantastic spot. But we don't always have those days. So we end up hopefully not needing to have a tow um, going down these back roads with four wheel drive. And I think, you know, anybody who's been down Point of Pines Road knows that it can sometimes go underwater. And, uh, you know, I will give props to the state of Alabama and the governor because when we did our Grand Bay celebration, she and her entourage joined us for that and traveled down this road. And thankfully we had our freshwater director on the side of the road with a uh, tow truck, um, a, with a, a winch on the back of his truck, ready to snatch us out of there if we got buried. But these are the kind of things we deal with and we don't always have Jason Throneberry down here helping us get out. So we're kind of all purpose folks here on the coast. The middle picture is us out mapping Lightning Point before we did the restoration. And you can't even get through this stuff, let alone when you have a GPS on your back and you're trying to map these areas. It's not easy. And at this point, we had pigs chasing us. That makes it really fun. So, um, you know, again, we, we think about these things, but this is what we do as part of restoration. And a lot of times, one of the first, first things we do to restore an area is we get in and we do fires. And lo and behold, here we have our deputy director, Keith Passon, kind of modeling how to get into a fire shelter, showing folks how to be safe, because we use fire to get out and kind of clear these areas out prior to getting on the ground and doing our mapping and restoration work. And these are really great balls of fire because this happens to be an aerial ignition fire with ping pong balls where they drop it in areas on broader landscapes so we can cover a lot more area. And when these little fires start, Basically, it's not one big sweeping fire that can cause uh, damage in an area that hasn't burned frequently. So these little fires all create small fires which merge and burn each other out. So it's a much safer way to do a burn by letting them all kind of merge together. And this is a technique that's being looked at to be um, put in place for Grand Bay. And once we burn out there, then we can get in and we can look at the other stewardship activities that need to be done. like any kind of other habitat management, invasive species control, and that kind of thing. But this first initial burn is what's going to kind of set the stage. It's gonna clear the laundry out of here, and we'll be able to get in there and kind of see what's going on. So we're super excited about this. But again, these are hard days in the field, folks. So next up on your phones, how important is it for TNC to assist state and federal agencies with land management? So we're getting our ducks in a row, but we're also trying to help others get their ducks in a row. Everybody's gonna think it's important. Oh yeah, we have somebody thinking it's not as important. But we do think it is important. Um, I think if we can help them especially get those first burns done, get some of those initial management activities so that the sites are kind of in a decent state, I feel like they can get a better handle on how things move forward and they can help um, kind of take over that long-term maintenance on their own that's maybe a little less frequent and a little less dicey on the first round. And that's what our stewardship program is working super hard on. So I'm glad everybody acknowledges that it's really important. Next up on our countdown, number three, sorting trash at Lightning Point. And who would have thought for coastal restoration, we'd have to go out and go through trash. And this is the trash at Lightning Point and us out there prior to even having the funds in hand, looking at this site and trying to figure out what the heck are we gonna do? So when we go out, we end up with sometimes large equipment, which you see in the top right corner, helping us pick this up once it's collected. 
But if you see in the, on the right side, the other two pictures are people, actually four to five folks going out and collecting this. Um, it ended up, you know, being a sensitive area, so we didn't want to run heavy equipment in to pick this up. So people actually did it. And what we ended up doing was actually sorting this trash out. You see Mary Kate and Caitlin in quick time sorting this out. I'm telling you, it did not go this fast in person. Um, there are only a few coastal staff, so it took a few days to do this. But we think it's really important for a couple of reasons. Um, you can, first of all, you can see the before and the after. You know, we're making a difference. We want it cleaned up. We don't want to perpetuate trash in the environment. The other thing is that of that five tons, we were able to recycle about half of it. And if we hadn't sorted that out, that would have been that much more trash that went to the landfill. And I think for us, we really need to lead by example and show that we, we can do this and, and sort it out. So it was, a, was it disgusting? And was, there was some really disgusting stuff in there? Absolutely. But I really feel like it was um, important for us to do. So now, pick up your phones if you've got them handy. Do you participate in trash cleanup days like Coastal Cleanup? And those aren't always hosted by the Nature Conservancy, but we have great partners that help do that. Oh, we've got a lot of people. Never! So I would say if you never, ever participate, but you really want to, shoot something to that email that hopefully Philanthropy has posted in the chat box, and we will put you on a list because it is something you should experience at least once in your life. All right, so in our countdown of the top five hardest days, we get to number two, which is monitoring our restoration sites. Um, it wouldn't do us any good to do a bunch of restoration and not understand if what we're doing is working or not. So we do a lot of monitoring of different types. Um, what you see on the left slide is Mary Kate and Dina walking down, I mean on the right side is Mary Kate and Dina walking down the shoreline and what they are doing there is actually um, GPSing, kind of mapping out the, the reef footprint on our reefs. And why this is important is because we figured out that some of our reefs were flattening out. The bag shell was breaking down and they were flattening out over time and what we really needed to do is make sure that vertical topography stayed in place to break the waves. We want the habitat, but we also want the wave breaking. So they, we go out about every year, um, every other year, we map the footprints, but we also map the shorelines. So that area, the marsh that you see behind them, and if you notice, it's Alabama, but they're not in bathing suits. They are in <laughs> waders and, and uh, full body um, uh, down coats and stuff because it's not always warm in coastal Alabama. And in the top right, you'll see us out there at the crack of dawn, and literally sometimes that's when the tides are lowest for us to get out there. Um, in addition to doing the mapping, we do a lot of uh, biological monitoring, and we have to make our own equipment. So here we are in my backyard with power tools, and we are the women of power tools. We're not afraid of any of them. We'll go out there and build cages with the best of them. So, um, and then we take those out and deploy them on the reefs, and and uh, and, um, and monitor what we get in them. So here at the lower uh, left, you'll see Mary Kate having walked the shoreline and she is actually waist deep in the mud stuck. We actually had to throw a rope and haul her out of there because she was so stuck she could not get out. Um, sometimes our monitoring is like a treasure hunt. So we always count bivalves, mussels and oysters at our sites. But while we're trying to grab the oysters and mussels out of those cages that you see on the top right, sometimes we get little surprises and maybe not so little surprises, like that crab down in the center um, bottom picture. And when that thing grabs on, it will make you squeal. You're not necessarily expecting something that big or alive to be in that water where you can't see when you put your hand down in there. So it can get pretty exciting. And then on the left, you have Caitlin actually helping do some marsh monitoring where we're looking at marsh densities. This is black needle rush. And it's named that way because it's like needles. And when she walked in here, she had to walk in one path and not walk out the same path. Because if she did, she would be a human pincushion. It's painful. And sometimes we get home and you don't even want to, you know, you get in the shower and all of a sudden, at the death of a thousand cuts or pinpricks starts coming alive. 
but we feel like it's really necessary because we want to know how our how our restoration projects are performing so we can tweak them we can change them we can make the next one better so while it's not always pleasant i think it's very necessary so this is a little different one for this one i'd like you to type in a word that best represents why science is important for our work and this one I had a little glitch with on the, on the trial, so I'm hoping it works now. So if you type a word into your, um, into your message and send, hopefully it will pop up. Ooh, oh. I tried this with staff three times and it worked on the, on the uh, last two times and I can't believe it's not working. Come on. I'm gonna give it one more second. Oh, you guys, this, I'm so disappointed this didn't work. This is, oh, wait, somebody wrote something. So it's working for some folks. Yes, understanding. It's, it's super important for us to understand what types of um, critters are responding and, and what we're finding so that we can learn more and figure out, again, like I said, what to tweak, what to make better so that um, every project we do basically builds upon that base knowledge. And we do that within Alabama, but we do that across the South um, and across the Northeast, and we do it globally. So I think that's such a great um, value that the Nature Conservancy brings to the project. And yes, I agree with you all 100%. So thank you, and I'm so glad it worked. So the fifth and final, and my top hardest field days, is reef building. And this happens to be a picture on Fowl River where we were transplanting some of that lovely black needle rush um, and trying not to be poked. But reef building is tough. And, um, and I have some examples here. In that lower left um, picture, you'll see the staff actually helping spread oyster shell, which is kind of uh, it was a dog day of work, it was super hot, but when we're creating these habitats, we're not trying to just put mud out there and, or grass out there and walk away. We really want it to mimic nature, right? So sometimes it's tough, and we really wanted the areas lined with shell like a normal tidal creek would be lined with shell. So we got that out there. Now, we've since decided it might be really good to contract that out. So we're, we're thinking smartly as we're learning what's really difficult, but, um, but they're spreading shell there for the birds and the terrapins and the oysters that will colonize this area down the road. Um, the top middle is our very own Andrew getting poked planting that marsh grass from the previous slide. And then we have reef building. Um, oyster castles in the upper left, we have volunteers that were helping us float those out. And frankly, a volunteer came up with the little bins that you see in the upper right picture um, and donated those bins to us to use for building because they felt so sorry that the bags and, and the castles were so heavy for us to move. And then down on the bottom, we get large groups of people, sometimes 500 to 800 people out actually participating in this. But my top hardest day, I would have to say, is probably the same as Steve Northcutt's top hardest day, which was Helen Park in 2011, with a fireman's crew of, of maybe 500 people passing bagged oyster shell on a really cold January morning at 28 degrees. We'd get stuck in the mud and fall over and have people have to help us out of there. And we were freezing, but frankly, at the end, it was so exhilarating to see the smiles and the hard work result in those reefs that were just fantastic and still serve as fantastic habitat there. And I think everybody really got a lot out of it. Um, for us, that's the, one of the big drivers. And it's uh, today, it's best exemplified with our Lightning Point project. Um, we brought the community together on our project and, and you know, kind of working with the mayor and the county and NEP and several partners, the state, um, to bring this project together, and I think Mayor Downey best exemplifies um, our thoughts on the project. Oh, wait, 
have you participated in a refilled? Oh, good gosh, I'm not there yet with Mayor Downey. So you know if you've participated in a refilled, but you it now so get them on B. It says, but I really want to after hearing about it. Now remember that means you need to email Jeff and the philanthropy team at that at that email address so that the next time we can get you out there and have you help. And and much like with our monitoring and how we tweak our restoration sites as we move forward, I will tell you that our capacity and our capabilities of rebuilding have progressed since 2011 when it was my considered my hardest day in the field. So, um, so with that, I will tell you it's better. And we, do, we, we found good uh, ways to make it a lot easier on ourselves to accomplish the same thing. So, sorry, I started wrapping up, but why do we do it besides that someone has to? Well, we do it because we get to share our work. We have great partners and we couldn't do our job without them. And I'd like to think they couldn't do their jobs without us. That's what makes those partnerships really great because they work two ways. We set an example for others like with the trash. I mean, who really wants to sift through that trash? But if we, if we can lead by example, we should. At heart, we're geeks, we're science geeks and we wanna know why. And so that's part of what drives us as well. And if we weren't making a meaningful difference on the coast, we wouldn't do what we're doing. And again, now I'm gonna let you hear from Mayor Downey on what his thoughts are with Lightning Point, one of our, um, one of our Starship projects. I happen to the shoreline restore and where it was at in 1800. You know, I'm, I'm a lived here all my life and, and seeing what's going on here, plus the recreation point and the birding, what the Busco Nature Conservancy is going to create a trail and a lookout point and a bit off. We're already, we're already on the birding trail, but it's going to create another habitat for that. Fishing, uh, recreation, it's just uh, just all around. Anything you can name is going to be, it's going to make an impact for, for everyone that lives here and for generations to come, you know. It's not a quickie thing. It's going to be great. So we want, we want more projects where we have the community engaged like that. It's been, um, you know, it's been a hard project to pull off, but um, Mary-Kate rocked it out. And again, we're looking forward to the next lightning point. So we're really excited. And with that, I'll take any questions. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see folks. Remember to type your questions into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Judy, I'll read these to you. We've already got two questions here. Okay. So the first question is, what is the weirdest thing that you found in the trash at Lightning Point or anywhere else for that matter? Um, mannequin parts. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to find mannequin parts because you're not really sure what that origin was. It's just a little bit creepy to be sorting through a trash pile and find an arm or a leg. And thankfully, it was a mannequin part. It was definitely not real. So I would say that's the weirdest thing. That's pretty weird. It was very weird. Next question. In your tenure with TNC, what's been the hardest task of all? Whew. Um, I think, um, I think building our partnerships was really difficult in the beginning because I came in as an outsider to Alabama and I think building that trust and, um, building kind of the confidence for them to have in us has been difficult, but I think we've now laid a really great foundation and not just with the coastal program, but with the nature conservancy across the board with our programs. And now I feel like we're really, you know, we're really part of the Alabama team, not just within TNC, but with all of our partners with the state and the federal governments and, and all of that. And especially now with the, some of the locals. Exactly. So Judy, we have a couple of comments that aren't questions. And while I'm reading these to Judy, uh, if you do have questions, just type them in at the bottom of your screen where it says chat. So Steve Crockett says, great presentation. Thanks. I agree with him. Uh, Nancy Reeves, uh, one of our fellow fundraisers who's visiting us. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for doing the hard work for us. <laughs> and then um, here's another question. 
Do you do projects in ideal weather or just in January? We have such great weather here in the spring and fall on the bay. Now, where would the fun be in doing it when it's really nice out? <laughs> no. Yes, and we really do try. We really do try to do um, major projects when the weather is ideal. What we do have to work around, though, is the tides. And um, Jeffrey, you live on the bay, so you know that the tides are lowest in the winter. Um, so that's a lot of times we've got to actually physically see these reefs. And to do that, you know, we can't dive. We're not going to be able to see anything diving in Mobile Bay. So we've got to get out there when the tides are lowest. Um, we try to go in November and December when the tides are low. It's a little bit warmer before that kind of January cold air really settles in. But, um, but yes, we do try to do good weather too. Although sometimes the staff might argue that I try to do it on bad times regardless. Surely not. <laughs> Next question. What are some projects on the horizon? Well, everybody this next year will see that um, Helenwood Park is going to be ramping up. So we're really excited about that. And if everything goes well, we're going to try to incorporate some unique designs into that. We're, um, we're trying to partner with a non-traditional partner through ALDOT. And uh, they are tearing out a few bridges and we're trying to work with them now on some uh, reuse of the bridge rubble, much like we would reuse that beneficial dredge material and incorporate it into the core parts of our reefs, and then just put a veneer of that rock that we want on top for the settlement of the bivalves and for um, all of the other critters to kind of uh, dig into. So, so we're excited about that. We're, um, we're looking at some work down in, uh, at the Perdido Islands, which is really exciting, where there's a lot of boat use down there, and we're trying to figure out the best way to manage wildlife needs and habitat needs with the boaters who use that area and love it and almost love it to death. So um, yeah, we've got, we've got a few more things coming up and, um, and we're still working on those public access and amenities that are going in at Lightning Point. So, um, so that's on the horizon and, and hopefully everybody will be seeing smoke from Keith and his team um, this coming fall for Grand Bay when we finally get that fire off the ground, which will be fantastic. Okay, Judy, we have probably enough time for two more questions, and here's the first. How much longer will the BP monies be available? So they're still being allocated out. Our monies through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation are close to being used up or allocated for um, Alabama. But there are other monies through damage assessment, through the restore buckets one, two, and three that um, that are going to be going for some time into the future. And even once they've been allocated, sometimes it takes a couple of years to get the designs um, set for those projects. So I think we're gonna be seeing BP related projects for probably another 15 or more years. Good. So I see no other questions. Judy, as always, Great job. Thank you so much for taking this time out of your busy schedule to uh, talk to us about your projects. If our audience has additional questions about this particular conservation pro project or any of our work, please email us at philanthropy.alabama at tnc.org. Finally, no matter what is happening in the world, our work continues uninterrupted.